We only need one, right? <laughs> Look, they're just uh, going on, aren't they? You know, this didn't happen last night. Good morning. You know, last night at the Sing Along Messiah, when I stood up, everybody went hush. And then they all applauded in unison. And I told them, that's never happened to me before. That's... <laughs> uh, you're too kind. You're too... We're, glad, we're glad you're here on this second Sunday of Advent. Welcome to the worship of God at First Baptist Church. Uh, today is a good day, as all days in Advent are. Uh, let's take a few minutes and look at the long list of church activities in the bulletin. Um, I'm not going to read this to you because that would take the place of the sermon and be more boring than the sermon would be. Um, but a few highlights of importance. Uh, the first is that this evening we are caroling. Uh, 5.30 to 8, we will be loading up in the bus and going around and caroling to folks uh, that our church loves. And that's we'll be about that. And then at 8 o'clock, we'll have the caroling after party uh, at w the Watsons. Uh, after fellowship is a tame way to put it. It's the after party. Uh, so come and carol with us. Uh, meet here in the parking lot at 5.30. Uh, it's always a good time. Skipping down the list, and uh, you'll want to attend to this list uh, this week, but I'm going to skip on down and note that the cantata dress rehearsal for the choir that is, uh, has ascended, uh, the choir is at 7.30 on Wednesday. And then skipping further down, you'll see that at 6 o'clock next Sunday night is the candlelight lessons and carols service. That's the service where we gather in this room, we, uh, we do lessons and carols, and then we go out on the lawn and inaugurate the, um, the live nativity uh, as, a, as a congregation. So you'll want to be aware of that, and of course the live nativity uh, is the next. And then even over on the back, there are more uh, festivities. We do a lot during Advent. I won't read those to you except to say uh, check the back as well. And then one further announcement uh, that David Mike has asked me to make is about this insert right here. You'll notice that at the top it says countdown, 10 days. Believe it or not, uh, we have 10 days before we assemble Christmas baskets on a Wednesday night in the chapel. Uh, this is the list of things we still need uh, to put in those Christmas baskets. So if you would, if you're able, uh, bring a donation uh, off of this list and it'll go to feed uh, families in need this Christmas season through our Christmas baskets. As I said earlier, today is the second Sunday of Advent. Today is the Sunday that we light the candle of peace. And it's also a communion Sunday. Uh, so it'll be a busy Sunday with handbells and communion and the candle of peace. But I'll be preaching from the gospel lesson. So tend to the visit of Mary with Elizabeth when it comes by in the service. And listen for those themes throughout the service as we go along. Now, before the choir uh, sings... I invite you to stand and greet the people around you.
Let's all join together and sing our praises. Our first carol is number 83, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. We'll stand together as we sing. God of hope and encouragement, we come in the midst of this season of busyness and preparation to find a time and a space to slow down, to breathe, and to wait. We need to prepare our hearts to accept the gift that you give of grace and love. And we need to focus on your promise that when the Messiah comes, nothing will ever be the same. Give us your peace today. May it happen in our time of worship. Amen. You may be seated. Advent is a time to watch. During Advent, we watch for hope in the midst of despair. We watch in hope for the Lord. Our God in During Advent, we watch for forgiveness in the midst of rebellion. During Advent, we watch for peace in the midst of conflict. We watch in hope for the Lord. Our God in During Advent, we wait for power and weakness. During Advent, we turn our hopes toward lasting peace. We watch and hope for the Lord, O come Emmanuel. <clears throat> this morning, we like the this morning we light the second candle on the Advent wreath. The first candle, the candle of hope, reminds us that Advent is a time of hopeful waiting. We wait in anticipation for God to fulfill the promises set forth in the scriptures. The second candle, the candle of peace, reminds us that Advent is also a time of watching. We watch with expectant eyes, trusting that God is active present and constantly at work, leading all of creation toward the plan of redemption. As we light the second candle, we ask for faith to watch for God's presence and open eyes to see all that God is doing.
We sing our Advent carol. It's an insert in your bulletin. We'll sing the second verse today, the, the verse of peace. The prophet celebrates God's promise for the small city of Bethlehem and points toward its future. A reading from the book of Micah. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from old from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. If the Assyrians come into our land and tread upon our soil, we will raise against them seven shepherds and eight installed as rulers. Here ends the first lesson. In just a few moments, we'll say our prayers, and as we did last week, we will sing the Lord's Prayer. It's number 382 in your hymnal, if you'd like to get that ready. And as you do, let's pause and let's prepare our hearts to pray together. Good and gracious God, we pray to you this morning that we might get a taste of peace. Peace, O God, is something that, uh, if we're honest, we don't always know what it means in this world in which we live. Peace, God, conjures a lot of feelings and a lot of emotions and a lot of thoughts within us. And God, whatever peace is, whatever it really is, we pray that you will impart it on us this Advent season. Show us the way toward peace, to be peacemakers, perhaps. And God, uh, help us to be peacemakers from all sorts of things in this world, from our own thoughts and anxieties, from the sicknesses and illnesses that keep our loved ones down. In a world that violence seems to be the norm, God, show us peace. Peace that passes all understanding. Peace that we can rest in, even this morning. Amen. 
You all did a fabulous job. That was wonderful. I don't even have the nerve to get up there and do that, so you all did a great job. Pat each other on the back real quick. Good job, good job, good job. Way to go. <laughs> Hello. Come sit down. Yay. Um, so this is our week of peace. We are in the second week of Advent, and the candle that the Shoemate family just lit was the candle of peace. We, got, we did hope last week. And talked about all the hope that we have and probably a little bit of the excitement of Christmas and Jesus coming and all that those wonderful things that are going to happen in the next few weeks. But this week is the week of peace. You know how the whole beginning of this week it rained? It started raining Sunday morning and it didn't stop raining it felt like until today. But it has rained and rained and rained. And you know how you can hear rain? Like, you know how you can, well, I mean, I knew when I woke up in the morning, oh, it's still raining, because I could hear it immediately. And you could walk outside, or you could look outside, and you could hear it, couldn't you? You can hear rain when it's raining. You hear cars splashing through the puddles, and just, you can hear it. And then I got to thinking about snow, because I was thinking about how I wished all that rain, it was a little bit colder and all that rain was snow. That would have been a whole lot more fun. I was thinking about snow, and you know, you can't hear snow. You ever went to bed at night, and there's nothing out there, and then you wake up in the morning, and you start getting ready for school, and somebody goes, hey, we don't have school today. There's snow out there, and you're like, what? Is there really? I didn't hear it. Do you ever hear snow? I mean, you can sit, and you can watch it fall, and it's beautiful, but you don't hear it. And then, this is my favorite part about snow. Then, when the snow's covered everything up, everything else gets kind of quiet, doesn't it? You don't hear as many sounds. Maybe it's because there's not as many cars out driving around in the snow. I don't know. But you just don't. It's a whole lot more quiet and peaceful. I love being in the snow and feeling that peace. And you know, peace is kind of like snow. When we have peace, we don't hear it coming. We don't... It doesn't announce itself. It just kind of happens. And then when peace settles over everything, everything gets kind of quiet and still and calm. We have peace. It's kind of like a blanket of snow. The Bible tells us that along with having that hope and even that joy that we're going to get to, that Christmas is coming, we need to have peace. We need to have peace within ourselves so we can wait for Christmas like with a package of joy wrapped up in a blanket of peace. And we can be calm and we can just kind of sit back and enjoy the different and the quiet that Christmas brings us to. Because sometimes we get kind of caught up in the excitement and we forget that there's that quiet time to be thankful. Will you all pray with me? God, thank you for the joy that is Christmas, but thank you also for the peace that it brings us. Help us to take that peace and to spread it out in all the world so that everyone might feel that blanket of peace and your love like a soft white blanket of snow. Amen. mother Elizabeth and celebrates her pregnancy. A reading from the Gospel of Luke. In those days Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting the child leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Here ends the gospel lesson. Our hymn of stewardship, number 114, Gentle Mary Laid Her Child. Let's stand together.
Let's pray. God, help us to be still this season of peace and know that you are God. May we let our light shine in the lives around us. Help us to share our resources with those in need in our community, our state, our nation, and the world. Bless this offering we bring and grant us your peace in our hearts. In the name of the Messiah, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
For those of you who are bulletin readers, you'll notice that I'm not Christy. Christy has bronchitis, and she's not able to sing this morning, so we're going to uh, skip over that straight into the sermon. Uh, but I tell you that because so many of you have asked about her, and she is getting better. So that's, that's the word, but, uh, but I am a sore replacement for Christy. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, today is a communion Sunday. And on a Communion Sunday, I see a sermon as more of a chip shot than a long drive. More of a chip shot than a long drive. On a Communion Sunday, the liturgy of our service, the order of the pieces, moves toward the table rather than the sermon like it does most Sundays. And I think it's fitting that we lit the candle of peace that one down there we lit the candle of peace on a communion Sunday on our way to the table this morning we are greeted with this text from the gospel of Luke and it is joyful isn't it it's short but it is joyful Mary rushes from wherever to wherever The towns aren't named, but Mary rushes to this unnamed town in the Judean hill country to greet and stay with Elizabeth. Elizabeth, you remember last week, is expecting a child, and her husband, the priest Zechariah, has been unable to speak ever since he had that encounter with the angel Gabriel. Mary rushes into this scene, and after having her own encounter with the angel Gabriel, she and Elizabeth celebrate. That's what they're doing in this text. We are told that Mary enters the house, greets Elizabeth, and the urgency of the text, the rushing, the with haste, the urgency denotes excitement. When Mary speaks to Elizabeth, I imagine that it's something like what happens at family gatherings, maybe yours at Thanksgiving. Oh, it's so good to see you. How are you doing? I'm so glad you've come. That happens at family gatherings, even if it doesn't last very long. It happens, and I imagine that Mary and Elizabeth have this kind of exchange because even the baby... In, uh, that Elizabeth is carrying, gets excited enough to give a celebratory kick. You notice that in the text. And Elizabeth is so excited to see Mary that she boisterously says, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me? That the mother of my Lord comes to me. For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. That's what Elizabeth says to Mary. In other words, oh, it's so good to see you I'm so glad you came to visit me. In other words, in other words. Today's text is a text of joy. It's a text of hope. It's a text of peace. There's peace in this text. And yet, there's a pitfall in this text for we modern readers of the Bible a pitfall that we need to be aware of. With news raging in our modern context, and news is raging these days, with news raging about shootings and gun control and psychological evaluation and assistance, this joyful, this hopeful and peaceful text can invite us down the road of despair if we're not careful about it. It can invite us down the road of if only, 
it were that way. It can invite us down the road of, that's a nice story. The world used to be a better place. I wish, I wish we could get back to that place. You know, that place that is calm, that is bright, that is peaceful. I wish we could get back to that place, if only. What I want to say in the sermon this morning is that this text is actually a caution against that kind of sentimentality because it is sentimental ta- sentimentality that causes us to say, if only, if only, if only we can get back to Eden the way it used to be. If only we had FDR again or Lincoln or Reagan, if only we had Harry or Homer or Charlie or Jake or Jim again, if only they were such great people. Whatever happened to the statesman, whatever happened to the great people, if only things were as peaceful and hopeful as that moment when Mary rushed over to Elizabeth's house and they celebrated, if only. Do you hear the undertone in that? I hope you do, because there's an undertone in that kind of thinking. And the undertone is that they were extraordinary people. And they were great, no doubt about it, but they were extraordinary people. But we, we're only ordinary people. They were extraordinary. That time was extraordinary. But we are ordinary. This time is ordinary. What could we hope to do in the face of ordinary. Do you hear that undertone in sentimentality? The liability of sentimentality is that it lulls us into a sense of powerlessness. That we don't have what it takes. That it's not there. It's not possible for us. And it's a very human thing to do, by the way. It's very human, and I'd bet money that uh, if, if you have lived in the last 24 hours or 48 hours, you've probably done this, subtly, overtly. I bet money that everybody has done this at some point with that raging news cycle in the TV. But it's also my hunch that if those people, if those people that, were, uh, that we were talking about, if they were here, that they would say, you know, we're ordinary people too. Don't you think they would say that? You knew them better than I. Don't you think that they would say we are ordinary? We put our pants on one leg at a time just like everybody else. And if they would say that about themselves, they might also say that about the world around them, that it is a challenging place, but that we worked hard, we did our best, and that God met us several times along the way. Now that's just a hunch, you know better than I, but I think that's reasonable, don't you? It's a pitfall to read a text like this joyous text of Mary and Elizabeth's meeting 
with an if-only lens. If only the world were that peaceful. If we allow ourselves to do that today, the pitfall is that we don't take seriously the Magnificat that Mary is about to sing right after this text. The Magnificat is certainly a triumphant song. It's a joyous, boisterous song. But it also has words in it like these. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Who needs a Savior? Probably not people at peace, right? My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. God has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Lowliness. He has scattered the proud. God has brought down the powerful. God has lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry. God has helped his servant Israel. You know, if you listen carefully to this joyful, boisterous, peaceful text, you hear an old, aching world in the background, don't you? Lowly, hungry, powerful. You hear the old, aching world. It's right there in the text, just after this passage where these two women meet. Right there in the midst of the joy and the hope and the peace of this beautiful moment between Mary and Elizabeth. It's always been there. And while we always have and likely always will return or want to return to Eden, Mary's jubilant, joyful song reminds us that this old world is more the same yesterday and today than it is different. It's more the same yesterday and today than it is different. If that's the case, it also recast our heroes. It also recast our heroes. As good as they were, the FDRs, the Lincolns, the Reagans, the Harrys, Homers, Charlies, Jakes, Jims, my hunch is that if they were sitting here, they'd say, you know, we're ordinary too. We put our pants on one leg at a time, just like everybody else. And along the way, you know, God helped us a lot. Now, you knew them better than I did, but my hunch is that that's true. It's my sense that longing for Eden keeps us from actually attaining peace in the world. Longing for Eden, reading a text like this and wishing if only keeps us from celebrating the now. And celebrating is what Mary and Elizabeth are doing. Mary and Elizabeth, this story, these women in the midst of a tumultuous, militaristic, threatened world of Roman occupation, right? Mary and Elizabeth find a way to celebrate anyway in the midst of this old, aching world. And the Bible says they spent three months together doing it. Three months. Today, we lit the Advent candle of peace. Thank you, shoemates. We lit the Advent candle of peace, and it is an audacious thing to do. That little flame right there, flickering, open, exposed, 
in this old aching world, in this tumultuous, occupied, militaristic world of ours. Today we light the candle of peace and we admit, I think, that we don't know all the answers of peace. I certainly don't. I wish I did. But I do believe one thing as I read this text. One thing. Like the flame of that candle right there, I believe that peace begins small. Peace begins small. In small acts of kindness, in acts of charity, peace begins small. Small enough that we realize that this table down here, this table, it's not our table. No, this table is God's table. And that all of God's people are welcome at God's table. All of God's people. You know, peace is a small thing. It begins small. Maybe so small that it embodies an important question. Who? Who is welcome at God's table? Who will you invite to God's holy table? I believe peace begins right there. Amen. As I said earlier, this is God's table, and all Christians are invited to this table at First Baptist Church. You did that long, long ago because you wanted to be a peaceful people. At this time, we will observe the ordinance of Holy Communion. We will partake of the Lord's Supper. As per our tradition, all y'all are invited to partake this morning. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. All who come to me shall not hunger, and all who believe in me shall not thirst. With Christians around the world and throughout the centuries, we gather around these symbols, this bread, and this cup. Simple elements that speak of nourishment, transformation, and inclusion. John Parker is coming to have our prayer for the bread this morning. Will you join me in prayer? We want to be special, Lord. We want to do special things. We want to be exceptional. We strive for that. And it's so hard to calm down and to reflect and to realize that you want us as we are. Help us to discover gratitude and peace and acceptance in the grace of your gift of Holy Communion. These symbols so ordinary and daily in our lives, bread and juice, that somehow 
mean more. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Remember, on the night when Jesus and his disciples had their last together, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. As often as you do so, 
in remembrance of me. In the symbol of the broken bread, participate in the life of Christ and dedicate ourselves anew to being Christ's disciples. Mark Watson will come and have our prayer for the cup. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Jesus, during this time, we think of a little baby in a manger and we would really like to keep you there. We don't really want you to grow up and be a young man walking dusty and tired through the countryside who will eventually be crucified on a cross. But we know that you did that because you love us. You loved, you did love us and you love us now. You love us so much that you were willing to go through all the all the pain, all the suffering, take all the time to do the things you did. And because you did that, Lord, uh, let us not have our joy decreased here in this season, but have our joy increased. And know that as a little baby, you had things to do, but let us now worship you as, a, as that little baby. And at the same time, remember all the things that were to come. And Lord, during this time, as we take of the cup, let us remember. Amen.
in the same way. Jesus took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant poured out for you and for many. Do this as often as you do so in remembrance of me. In the symbol of the cup, we participate in Christ's new life. Let's say a prayer together. We give you thanks, loving God, that you have again refreshed us at your table. Strengthen our faith. Renew our hope. Increase our love for one another. Help us to be peacemakers. We have taken the bread of life here at this table so that we can go forth and be the bread of life in this old world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we leave this morning, let's sing a carol together. Child in the Manger, number 112, we stand. And now, as you prepare to go from this place and continue the pilgrimage of Advent all the way to Christmas, go with this benediction, this good word. Depart now in the fellowship of God the Father. And as you go, remember, by the grace of God, you were born into this world. By the strength of God, you have been kept all the day long, even until this very hour. And by the love of God, the love of God fully revealed in the face of Jesus, you and we are being redeemed. Amen. Amen.